I studied in Münster in Germany, but I've now lived in the UK for over 25 years. Uh, and that's where I did most of my, my work. Um, and uh, some or a lot of that work was on delusion infestation. So I'm really delighted to have got the opportunity to speak to you today. I wanted to just mention my collaborators because uh, Gail asked me to focus on a little bit on a, on, a, on a European perspective as well. We do have in Europe a number of places where there are joint clinics or collaborative clinics. And these are usually between a liaison psychiatrist like myself and someone from either dermatology like Professor Bewley in London uh, um, or Professor Walker in London or people from tropical medicine. And that's uh, the uh, clinic that I run with Professor Squire in Liverpool. I've also got uh, contacts in Italy and in Russia. And when I talk about our, our data later on, we normally refer to those clinics that these people run. I have to say, though, that there are only two clinics at the moment in the UK where we have this kind of setup on a regular basis. And, uh, and therefore, we are trying to actually um, make this a more common feature, uh, but the other alternative in the absence of being able to set up those clinics is we have plans to actually make sure that we can provide uh, multidisciplinary advice to other clinicians. So we are planning to allow other clinicians to ask panel members what they think about particular cases so that they can get advice with these particularly difficult patients. Another thing I should probably say is that you will all be aware that there are big differences between the European and the American health systems. Uh, in the UK in particular, it's a very nationalized health system. So we don't have to worry about insurance. Everybody is in short. Everybody gets the same treatment at the point when they need it. And it's paid for by a general, by just general taxation. So we don't have some of the problems that you have, but there is still doctor hopping going on uh, with multiple referrals to multiple specialists that our patients go through before they see us in our specialist clinic. Now, this is uh, in North Wales where I work and where I usually go walking. So I just thought I'll give you a few nice pictures along the way to make it a bit more interesting, given that you've just seen lice and other little insects so far. So you won't get them from me because I work as a psychiatrist. We've already spoken about this, so I'll run through this very quickly. The diagnosis of a delusional infestation is basically one uh, of exclusion. And like any delusional belief, it is characterized by the fixed belief that in this case, one or one's environment is infested with either insects, parasites, inanimate objects, and so on. And there is an absence of any medical evidence for this. Now, the interesting thing is that parasites have become much less of, a, uh, of an alleged pathogen, whereas inanimate objects have taken on about 25% of the alleged pathogens. And this is where the Morgellons disease that was already mentioned by Gail uh, in, in detail comes in. So just to put this out at the beginning, for me, Morgellons is not an actual entity. Morgellons for me is delusional infestation with inanimate objects. I have seen patients who did not actually think that it was their uh, body that was infested, but the environment. I always remember a really one of my earliest cases of delusional infestation where a uh, patient believed 
that the house was infested with rats. She could hear the rats. She thought she could occasionally see them. And she lambasted the local uh, pest control people from the council for not being able to get rid of the pest. She even got herself on the headline of the local newspaper. And uh, it was amazing how much a bit of Amisul pride actually helped to get rid of the rats in the end. But it took a long time to persuade her to take it. Yale also alluded to the various names um, in our 2009 publication on delusion infestation, we actually list, I think, about 30 names so far that uh, this illness has had. I find the ones that talk about phobia particularly um, unhelpful. As Gail rightly pointed out, it shows how confused people have been over, the, uh, over this whole issue. But I think now that we know that it's a delusional illness, it's not helpful to call it a phobia, which would be, psychiatrically speaking, a completely different illness with completely different ways of treating it. Ekboom, by the way, was a Swedish psychiatrist in the 1920s and 30s, and that was when he first uh, uh, came up with the name Dermatozonwahn, which is the German uh, phrase for it. At the time, most, psych most uh, psychiatric literature was in German, and later it was called Ekbom syndrome after uh, Professor Ekbom from Sweden. <clears throat> the reason why we in our group have uh, tried to change the name to delusional infestation is because the actual alleged pathogen has changed over time. So we have had a variety of illness descriptions uh, for this illness for centuries, but the, the alleged pest has always changed a little bit. So in the 19th century, understandably, we had scabies, typhus, the pest, and then later bacteria, insects, parasites, then viruses, and uh, very late in the 20th century, non-living pathogens. So in the 21st century, we started with fibers, threats, and so on. And it's really interesting that the so-called Morgellons is only really known in English and German-speaking countries. And if you know what the most common uh, languages are on the internet, it is English followed by German. So that is how it's being perpetuated. Those two languages make up about 65% of the entire content of the internet. And it's very unusual to see more, uh, Morgellons voiced by patients in countries where people don't speak either English or German. So insects have always remained common and insects are still the main common ones, as you can see. Uh, we had a 2010 publication where insects were the most common and parasites had gone down to only 13%. Other investigations show a slightly higher percentage for parasites, but insects are usually the most common and non-organic uh, alleged pathogens are becoming increasingly common. We felt that the name delusion infestation emphasizes the constantly changing pathogens. And that's really quite common in psychiatry that you have uh, changing themes and they change with, with the times. We have that with paranoid delusions, for example. In the past, it was the KGB that people thought were after them. Uh, now, then it changed to the CIA or Mossad. Now it changes to pedophiles and terrorists. And whatever is in the media is usually something that people will pick up and make their preferred uh, theme. We call that a delusional theme. So this is nothing unusual that we have a changing theme. My, my talk is based uh, in a large part on our new British Association of Dermatologists guidelines. And even though I'm a psychiatrist, I was invited to be part of the 
uh, process where we came up with those guidelines. So they are currently in the um, publishing process. We had a provisional acceptance from the G British Journal of Dermatologists where it's going to be published soon and then it will be officially published. Now, those guidelines suggest how to diagnose and how to manage. So they do include the diagnostic process. The methodology is accredited by the NICE guidelines, which are national guidance for all sorts of uh, medical conditions and treatments that take into account the uh, cost benefit as well as the efficacy and is usually evidence-based as far as that's possible, um, de depending on the various uh, illnesses and the credibility and availability of data. So we did the same. We started off with the literature search. And as you know, there is only one RCT on delusional infestation with 11 patients. And that was done um, in Hungary in the 1980s. That's the only RCT that exists. And the main reason is that it's unethical to um, put patients in a trial if they lack capacity to make decisions. If we wanted to say to people, do you want to be part of a trial? We would have to tell them this is for delusional infestation and they would immediately not want to be part of it. So it's been really difficult to get data. We have, met, we have looked at, um, at case reports, case series, and we've analyzed those for efficacy data and we published those. So that's where most of the data is coming from. There's also German guidelines on uh, delusional infestation. They are also reviewed at the moment and they will be published in due course. But the existing ones are not that dissimilar. They're just a lot shorter at the moment and they're part of the psychodermatology guidelines. So what the guidelines cover is to undertake appropriate investigations. They suggest that we do urine toxicology drug screens, consider validated tools to screen for anxiety and depression, and assess risk to self and others. And that becomes obvious when we look at the first two presentations and what kind of things people suffer from and what might actually also cause some of those problems. And um, I'm gonna go into a little more detail, but before I do that, <clears throat> because I know I speak to non-psychiatrists by and large uh, here, I. I, I just wanted to go through how psychiatrists actually diagnose a delusion. So in the past, Jaspers, one of the most famous psychiatrists of all times, set out criteria for delusions, but they are really not entirely uh, followed now. But by and large, we don't primarily look at whether something is definitely false about the content of what the patient is presenting with. Um, this might look to be the most obvious, but it can be a pitfall because uh, I always give the example, in people who are alcoholics, it's, it's very common that they develop the delusion that their partner has an affair and what we would look at as a psychiatrist is where the evidence is and what evidence the patient is, is bringing forward. So if the patient says, well, I came back home and I found my partner with someone else in bed, that is usually reasonable evidence to assume that they're, that they're having an affair. If, however, they say my partner was was late for two minutes when she, he or she came, came back from the shops. And that is why I know they're having an affair. That would not be 
seen as reasonable evidence to come to that conclusion. So we're actually looking at the evidence that someone is putting forward rather than looking at what, uh, whether it is completely impossible that the belief might be true. Another example would be if someone says to me, I think the CIA are after me. I can't ring Langley and ask. So I have no option but to look at the evidence. And if they say, I've already seen three black cars outside the house this morning, that for me would not be sufficient evidence that the CIA are after them. And the other thing, of course, is the, uh, the likelihood that that is the case. So the a priori likelihood that something is uh, happening. And if I talk to Joe Bloggs in Wrexham, the a priori chance that they are followed by the CIA is pretty negligible. So that's, that's how we would look at whether there is a possibility of a false belief. And then of course, we look at what evidence there is to the, to the country, if there is any evidence to the country, or if there is any plausible evidence that the patient is right. And so we look at the form of reasoning and not entirely at the implausibility of the content or the impossibility of the content. So that is uh, how we decide whether someone has a delusion. And yes, now you may say, um, but if you use those criteria, you can say that religious people are delusional or that all sorts that anti-vaxxers are delusional or that all sorts of people are delusional but that is not really the point the point is that when we look at delusions in a psychiatric context we look at delusions that are um, that make the the person suffer that have a clinical relevance and that is something that we may want to clinically address and that usually causes um, a high degree of suffering to the person or others around them. And that is usually outside the sort of normal context of what these people would be doing. So when we have a delusion, um, we often have the belief of being infested that arises unexpected to the patient. So this may be what we call a de novo delusion uh, that just arises out of nothing, or it might be after an actual infestation event. It is then falsely ascribed to the presence of an infestation. So people have some kind of skin lesion, for example, or they feel something crawl. We would just dismiss that but if you false, but these patients falsely ascribe it to an actual infestation. Then we come to the most important aspect uh, because we always predict uh, as humans what is likely to happen. And that prediction uh, is actually doing very well and is keeping us very well most of the time but sometimes we can get it really wrong. And what we found was that if you have specific pathology in specific parts of the brain that are responsible for how you interpret primary input, primary uh, sensory input, then it is possible that your predictions go wrong and you make what we call errors of probabilistic reasoning. So you favor the unlikely over the likely explanation. So you blame an infestation for the itch or the what you call a bite, when in fact the reality is that there are, there's a completely harmless explanation for it. But you don't see that because of your brain pathology, you think the unlikely actually is the likely. So you then... Uh, start to um, your belief evaluation system fails. You don't reject the hypothesis that an infestation is present. And that is what we call failed reality testing. So we always predict that's fine. 
But if you have a pathology and you get errors of probabilistic reasoning, you would normally get your reality testing that then dismisses that belief. And if you don't do that, you will, as uh, Gail and Nancy also described, at some point get to the point where you just don't allow any further criticism, but you do what we call um, delusional work, which means that every contrary belief is just being dismissed and uh, you develop a dysfunctional belief evaluation system that only ever confirms what you already think is right. So this is how we think that it's likely that these particular type of delusions develop. Now, the interesting thing is that when we look at MRI, MRI scans, we find that people with delusion infestation actually have slightly different pathology compared to those with other monodelusional disorders. And they are quite different to people who have, for example, schizophrenia with paranoid delusions. So there seems to be something relatively unique to delusional infestation that is not easily compared with, with other monodelusional disorders or schizophrenia. So coming to the diagnostic process, because it's a diagnosis of exclusion, we start having the suspicion because people give us really weird explanations for their, for their illness, for their experiences. And these experiences to them are really real. And if we don't consider them real, then we won't be able to help them much because to them, they are real and they really do happen to them. So it's important that we, we are clear that these experiences are real. What we can't share is the explanatory model. And what we normally say is, look, you've come to us as experts because you want us to keep an open mind and find a solution uh, and a reason for this. You may think it's this, but we have to take everything into account. And the possibilities are very, very uh, high. Now, the most common is probably uh, the medical explanations um, in terms of uh, other things that you would want to consider. And I'll just go through them quickly and try to focus on those that Gail and Nancy haven't mentioned already. Neurological uh, problems such as strokes are quite common, but also other neurological illnesses. Anything that can trigger puritus is, um, is, a, is a common cause. Some cancers, of course, do that. Equally, diabetes can give you peripheral neuropathies, which then cause uh, tingling sensations, and that can trigger delusion infestation. We mentioned thyroid disease. Jaundice, again, can produce intense itching, which can also trigger DI. There are many others, and we've had an ex uh, a very extended list. Otherwise, if you want a full list, uh, Gail and uh, and, a, and a team of us uh, are working on that. And a, and a list that was valid in 2009 is also in my publication with Professor Freudenmann in CMR, uh, which is available online for free. Um, secondly, psychiatric causes are common. Stimulant drug misuse is, is one of the really common ones. And um, I can maybe give you some data because we recently published data from our European uh, combined clinics. And we found that about, I think it was about 17 or 19%, uh, something like that, of people in these clinics uh, were positive for at least one illegal drug. And we counted cannabis there as well, even though I realize it's not illegal in all European countries. Uh, but that was interesting because cannabis and stimulants have all been implicated with delusion infestation, particularly cocaine. And we've, we've had a run recently of uh, cocaine and crack cocaine users. And it was very, and it's really very difficult because 
they basically don't want to stop what is always uh, firing up the symptoms again. Now, to give you an idea, um, th it was interesting that the uh, data was much higher for young men, but that's uh, the same in the normal population. So compared to WHO figures on drug use, the DI population is about two to three times more likely to be positive for stimulants and other, other illegal drugs. It's less common in the elderly, but not uh, completely impossible. Uh, another illness that is commonly associated with DI is dementia. That's probably the most commonly associated, even more commonly than um, anxiety and depression. Schizophrenia is also a possibility, but normally schizophrenia is known when you see the patient. Medication was mentioned already. I just want to uh, stress, and I know that we've already heard that um, the 10 most prescribed drugs in the US are all uh, possible culprits. Antibiotics are commonly forgotten by most physicians, but they're, they're really quite, quite common uh, to produce hallucinations and delusions, particularly in the elderly. The, stay, the same goes for steroids and some anti-tuberculosis drugs. And of course, never forget the dopamine agonists, particularly the anti-Parkinson medication. But there's a long and non-exhaustive list that you can find in the literature. So that leads us to what we normally consider to be appropriate investigations. This obviously depends on the, on the, on the presentations, but you always need to analyze the specimen. That's one of the most important things. In order to build trust, you have to investigate what the patient brings. And as was already mentioned, match boxes are not really common now. 25% uh, of patients or more now come with digital pictures. In fact, we have loads of people who show us pictures or videos they took on their cameras. And of, and of course, there's no persuading them that this is something that we don't use for, diagnosed, uh, for diagnostic purposes. Um, medication and drugs that can trigger DI always have to be excluded and make sure that you ask people for over-the-counter drugs, cocodamol, I forgot now what, what you called it, but codeine basically is metabolized uh, into an opiate and it's really common. That is the most prescribed drug in the UK. So we definitely uh, give opium to the, to the people. And standard, Standard bloods would normally include renal function, thyroid function, uh, uh, full blood count, thyroid function, for the obvious reasons that we want to exclude liver problems, thyroid problems, because they're all implicated uh, with possible um, DI and triggering DI. We also need inflammation markers, CRP, uh, white count, and we always look for eosinophilia because, as you probably know, uh, eosinophils are raised in systemic uh, parasitic infestations. Now, puritus and dementia screen may uh, require specific other investigations for the dementia screen. You would usually do a vitamin B12, a calcium, a folate, and those kind of things. So you just do what is uh, necessary in your particular practice. Same for puritus, which is a more extended liver screen, for example. If there is a possible history, you, uh, you would also look for HIV and infectious diseases. Uh, and if you think that there is strange neurology or other reasons why you may want to exclude a tumor, then you would be looking at a CT or, or MRI scan. Um, CT is usually sufficient to exclude a tumor, of course. With an MRI scan, you could actually look for 
changes um, with the brain pathways that are in keeping with delusional infestation. But for that, you would need very specialist analysis, and that's not available at most places. Now, skin biopsy are debated. They're largely not recommended because if uh, because when we looked at the data, no pathology has ever been found in any skin biopsy, or at least no parasitic pathology. And our general medical council guidelines, so the guidelines for doctors, say that we should never do any biopsy on healthy skin. So if we don't have a real reason, we shouldn't be putting the patient through something that is potentially difficult. I know some people argue that it should be done, but in my experience, if it's normal, the patient will always say it was the wrong bit of skin doctor, and they will just demand more and more biopsies and you don't get anywhere. What we do do is we normally continue to investigate specimen, uh, even when we know they're very unlikely to show anything, but that is more to build our trust. So in our own uh, clinic, just to give you an idea of what we get when we ask people to refer specifically for delusional infestation, we don't call it the delusional infestation clinic, we call it the combined clinic. And we have about 69% with the diagnosis of delusional infestation. So it's a, it's a reasonable screening. Uh, maybe the, fo the um, false positive, sorry, the false negative rate uh, isn't in there, but I would probably maybe want to get it up a little higher, but of course we want to be sure that we don't uh, miss people either. So 61% of those who returned reported improvements. And uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with C CGI scores, but they are scores from one to seven. One means you're not ill at all, and seven means you are one of the worst cases ever seen by that doctor. So the doctor rates the severity of your illness and it's a global impression. So you take into account holistically the, the suffering of the patient and the impact that the symptoms have on their quality of life. And um, what we find is that DI patients have a much more are much more impaired at baseline a, an average score of five is really quite ill. Um, and the 31% who were not diagnosed as DI, most of them had health anxiety. That's about half of them. Uh, so uh, that's something that you always need to bear in mind as a, as a differential diagnosis as well. The other thing that's interesting, and this brings us back to Gail's point about people seem to change after about six months and they get much more invested in the, in the actual delusion and that narrative and, and what it means to them. And what we've shown was that the duration of untreated psychosis is quite important. So the longer you've been ill, the less favorable are clinical outcomes. And this is measured by uh, CGI scores. So with people who have had DI for less than a year, we can normally get a reduction of three points, which is an enormous reduction on CGI. Whereas it's only about two in people who have had uh, DI for more than five years. Now that's still two, that's still really good. Uh, that's still a very, very clinically relevant improvement, but it's, but it's not as good as what you get in the, in the first year. Um, older people, or no, sorry, I'll take that back. People who are older at presentation also often don't get quite as well as people who are younger at presentation. But again, older people can often be more adherent to medication and uh, use fewer illicit substances, and that can be a real advantage for prognosis. 
<clears throat> so when we look at the, in, the entirety of what we're doing, we are primarily trying to get the patient's trust in order to make sure that we can move to suggesting antipsychotic medication. We also look at whether there may be other reasons why they have the symptoms they have. In our clinic in particular, we obviously look for parasitic infections, but we also look for other illnesses. We have diagnosed other illnesses, other medical illnesses, but they were chance findings. We've never ever identified a parasite. So in that sense, you could say that the screening's quite good because we never get actual parasitic infestations in that clinic. But we do get health anxieties, even with a good pre-screening. And you definitely want to check for all these other things. Now, cocaine use is something that is particularly common in that patient group. And um, it's something that can be very difficult to treat, particularly if they don't want to change their usage. So what are the treatment considerations? Uh, and this all comes now from, from our uh, British Association of Dermatologists guidelines. We recommend longer appointments. So the first appointment in our clinic is 60 minutes and follow-up appointments are 30 minutes, but they often overrun. Specialist clinics with psychiatrist presence are really what seem to have better results. And one of the reasons is what Nancy, I think, called a timeout period. What I do with Professor Squire is that if one of us feels that it is, we are really getting to the point where we're getting nowhere with a, with a patient, we often then refer to the other person. So that rather than getting either into conflict that is really unproductive or just getting frustrated and annoyed, uh, we can divert that and the other person can, can make another start. And for that reason alone, it's very helpful to have two people. To have a psychiatrist, I think, is really helpful because they usually know how to deal with people who are deluded, uh, which, which is an advantage. Now, the other thing is that uh, we normally, at some point, offer psychiatric follow-up. And our aim in the clinic is to get people involved in local psychiatric services. But that's only possible if you get people to have a degree of insight at some point that they're actually suffering from a psychiatric illness. That is possible in some, but a lot of people never gain full insight. They will only say at some point, oh, it's good, the, the pest have gone and the symptoms have gone, but they don't associate that with taking an antipsychotic. Antipsychotic medication is the one thing that actually works. So the success rates um, are between 60 and 100% um, from the case reports and, and case series that's, that we've analyzed. So that is what people actually need in order to get better. And that's the only thing they don't normally want to take. So we, we are in two minds, and I have to be very honest here, about how to approach this, because there are, in principle, there are two ways of doing this. You can say to the patient, look, we don't entirely know what this is, but uh, it's very unlikely to be a parasitic infest infestation, given all the evidence. Um, we don't th think it's something else, but we're going to keep an open mind. But there is also a psychiatric illness that can change the way your, your uh, brain works, and that can give you those symptoms. And then the other approach is to say these patients lack capacity to understand uh, and they can't make decisions about treatment. So we aren't going to tell them that they have a psychiatric illness in their best interest. But instead, we are saying that we don't really know what this is, but we do know that uh, if we see people or when we see people like that, they normally 
benefit from certain medications. And these are medications that we also use for psychosis, but in your case, we use it in a very small dose. And so we can correctly tell them that we don't think they have schizophrenia, unless of course they have schizophrenia, but that's rare. And then they are usually taking antipsychotics anyway. So we can correctly tell them that they don't have schizophrenia. And then we can say, it's a bit like you take aspirin in low doses to thin your blood and in high doses to treat pain. It's a bit like that. In high doses, we would, uh, we would treat schizophrenia with this medication, but you're very distressed and in low doses, we can help your distress. And that's how we often sell the antipsychotics to people. Now, I come to the choices in a, in a minute, but there is one thing that is peculiar to the United States, which is that a drug called Pimazide, which is a very old antipsychotic that was actually used in this Hungarian study that I alluded to at the beginning, um, in the States that only has a license as an anti-emetic, as far as I know. So it doesn't have a license for psychosis. So when people look it up, it doesn't come up as an antipsychotic. That is not the case in Europe, where it does have a license for schizophrenia. It also has a number of side effects that are less favorable compared to more modern antipsychotics. And that's why we don't normally suggest it as first line, but I'll get back to that. So the next thing is that if you have cases where you have either delusions by proxy or you have shared delusional beliefs, you would always want to treat the index case as a priority because the symptoms will disappear without treatment in the others if you manage to treat the index case. It's estimated that about 10% roughly are shared delusional beliefs. So you have at least one other person who really has a fixed belief. Now it's important when you look at delusions that not every delusion is held with the same intensity. We actually call that delusional intensity and some people have a much higher intensity than others. So some people you can, <clears throat> you can sort of talk out of this absolutely fixed belief. It's a bit like the placebo Nancy mentioned when the pest control comes and, de and defumes the house. For a while it works and then the delusion takes over if there is more evidence uh, as far as the patient's concerned. So the people who have quite a sort of... Um, willingness to explore alternative explanations, alternative to the one they put forward. People who appear to have a sort of shifting delusional belief, they are usually the people where we can be a bit more open about the possibility of a, of a brain disease. But people who have a, an extremely high delusional intensity, they are usually the ones where we wouldn't even explore whether they would uh, like to look at alternative explanations because they are the people where it's usually really pointless and you lose their trust immediately if you even go there. So, but what we never do is agree with a patient's opinion on something that is clearly unscientific. So we, we don't give in to the delusion. So we don't say, oh, Oh, oh yes, I can see that you've got parasites. We would say, yes, I can see there is something there, but I can't tell you what that is without looking properly under an uh, inner lab at it. We have an accredited lab and they will be able to show, to tell us what it is. And then they, it, it invariably comes back as skin debris or other environmental debris. And then we have the possibility to say, well, it clearly isn't a parasite. I can see that there is something, but it doesn't seem to be a parasite. So what, what, whatever it is, that may not be 
uh, what's causing the symptoms. So we may have to look at other, um, at other options. Whereas in people with a high delusional intensity, we would probably say something like, look, this is what the lab found. We don't know what this is, but maybe we can just focus on treating your symptoms instead because we want to help you get better. So if it's our priority to treat the symptoms, maybe we can do something against the distress and we see how that goes. So you, you have two different approaches and, accord, and probably according to what you think is more ethical, according to your experience, um, you may want to use one or the other, or you may want to use both um, and sort of look at the patients that you have in front of you. But uh, I wouldn't say one is right, the other is wrong. I think we need more data to actually know which, whether there is a subtype of patient that might respond better to one approach or another. But it's very clear that a trusting relationship is the foundation of achieving anything at all. Proactive communication with other clinicians is really important because you need to make sure that you don't have more people who do further investigations. Now that is much easier in Europe where usually one or two people control further referrals. And when they say no, there's very little the patient can do except if they want to spend lots of money that they often don't have to see someone privately, but that's not particularly common. Uh, so we have much better chances to control where people might go than you have in the, in the States, where I appreciate that anyone can probably go to any doctor they, they, they like, which, which is a bit of a problem. Um, treatment, when it's successful is for at least a year before we could recommend stopping it. So now coming to which antipsychotic to use, it appears that there is an advantage of dopaminergic drugs such as sulpride or amisulpride, which unfortunately doesn't exist in the United States, but there seems to be an advantage over dopaminergic drugs um, of dopaminergic drugs over broad receptor spectrum drugs. And most of the modern antipsychotics are broad receptor spectrum drugs. So are most of the old ones. So sulpride and amisulpride are an exception in that sense because they're particularly dopaminergic. Second generation ones we use regularly would be amisulpride, olanzapine, risperidone, First generation ones that are commonly used are sulpride, haloperidol, perfenazine, depo medication. And as I said, pimazide is no longer the first choice according to most people. Um, I know that Dr. Ku, who's going to talk later, is probably going to persuade you to use pimazide as first choice because of the advantage that in the UK, it doesn't have a license for schizophrenia. And I accept that that is a significant advantage. Um, but in Europe, we don't actually have that luxury. So we're not able to use it with that advantage. So we see the disadvantages, which is a relatively poor side effect profile compared to some of the other medications on the list. Now, Dr. Ku would probably rightly suggest that in the low doses that we give it, most people don't have side effect problems. And I get that point. But what we have done is we have taken, uh, we have extrapolated schizophrenia efficacy data to our first choices. And in schizophrenia, other than clozapine, amisulpride and tulanzapine are the two most efficacious drugs. And that's why we are using them first. They also have a rather different side effect profile. So by giving one, you can avoid particular side effects and by giving others, you have a chance to avoid other specific side effects. Whereas pimazide has a sort of broad side effect uh, profile. But so that's uh, the ones that we would use. And by and large, we use them 
In Britain, we have something called the British National Formulary, which entails all the drugs uh, that are available. And uh, it gives you maximum doses. And by and large, our target dose is about a third of the maximum dose of what you would give for schizophrenia. So for example, amisulpride, the maximum dose is 1200 milligrams a day. We would aim for 400. Olanzapine, it's 20. We would aim for five or 7.5. Risperidone, um, we would normally aim for uh, two, two milligrams, maximum is uh, eight. So that's, so, so you see sort of roughly a third. Other principles for the treatment is that we always need to try and initiate treatment um, if we want to help. So you would probably talk to a physician that the patient might uh, like to see or might, is likely to see. And um, we need to persuade those clinicians that the people already trust to be bold enough to actually start the treatment because they're less and less likely the more they doctor hop to actually take medication. Patients are highly unlikely to agree to psychiatric assessment. And if you insist, they just won't turn up. So as uh, Nancy, I think it was mentioned earlier, that's a path that is very unlikely to work. So I always say, if you see it, try and treat it. I say that particularly to dermatologists and to uh, primary care physicians, but also to hospital physicians. And joint clinics or combined clinics with psychiatry seem to produce better outcomes. So if we look at an intention to treat analysis, about 50 to 60% of our patients get better, whereas Otherwise, it's about 5% who actually end up taking antipsychotics and get better. <clears throat> Changing substance uh, often works, and we don't know why that is, but it's probably because people haven't actually reliably taken the first drug that you offered them anyway. So uh, you're in a situation where you think it's a it's the different drug that's working, but in effect, they are probably just taking it. And I think you have to accept that it really isn't easy to help these patients. They are very difficult. <clears throat> so that, that's, that's why we suggest combined clinics and possibly people who have expertise giving advice to other doctors because um, this is a patient group that suffers significantly and they are in a very difficult uh, predicament and they feel that no one helps them. They don't ever get anywhere and they need someone they can trust and who tells them, I take you seriously. I know you have these experiences. We want to find out what they are. In the meantime, I see you very distressed maybe you want to try some medication that in our experience seems to help people, uh, people that have your kind of experiences and symptoms. And so that's, that's what we normally do. Um, we haven't had too many people who thought they had more gallons and we don't really entertain more gallons, to be honest. Um, so I don't know to what degree it's an issue for you in your practice, uh, but we don't find that we have too many people who insist. I know that in London, they have more problems with that. And they, again, they go about it by saying, we just don't know what it is for now, and, uh, but let's focus on how we can help you. And so that is what, how, how they now normally get around it. It's much more difficult, of course, when, you, when people ask you directly what you think this is. And that's where I, for example, and Professor Squire, um, who does the clinic with me, are quite reluctant to directly lie. So we would never lie to a person. We would try 
to maybe be a bit more vague when there's high delusional intensity. But if people insist, we would, we would tell them. I know that my friends in London have used the term unexplained demopathy, uh, but that seems to have worked for them. But I would be a little more not in, I, I wouldn't be happy to put something like that on a clinical letter. But at the same time, I accept that if you put delusional infestation on a clinical letter, or in the American case, it goes to the insurance and they see it for sure, that's difficult. And in our case, people often want to see their medical notes as well. So again, we have this predicament. Do we write a separate letter to the family doctor or the referrer, or do, do we remain vague? Uh, but at some point, we need to let the other clinicians know what we're dealing with. So um, those, those are dilemmas that are not easy to, to overcome. Um, and I think that's why, whilst I don't like it, I can see why Professor Bewley and his team sometimes use things like unexplained demopathy, because it gives them uh, the possibility to put something on a letter and otherwise the patient might well be disencouraged and just leaves and you never see them again. So those are the real dilemmas that we have this with these patients who are highly ill, highly deluded, suffer a lot, uh, but could in almost all cases so easily be treated if only they took medication. And now you're probably gonna say, so why don't we use the Mental Health Act and section them and treat them against their will, which is a good question, but it's far more difficult in practice than it sounds. And it also really antagonizes patients. And if you then get a judge who lets people go after a week, you've lost everything because it's not enough time to, to get a benefit and they will never trust a, a doctor again. So these are the things that you all need to consider when you, when you go down that route. Um, personally, we have made bad experiences with that because uh, often the sectioning process didn't actually lead to a, to a detention because there was always someone in the process who said, well, they've been suffering for so long now, why should we detain them now? And so uh, legally it, it can be tricky. Um, 